As we head into the spring property market, what can we expect for the rest of 2023? Will we finally see a meaningful increase in new listings? And if we do, how much of an increase will it take to tip the demand and supply scale and see prices fall again? But of course, prices haven't been rising everywhere across the country. We seem to be back to a more normal market in that regard. But how will the regions fare now that the exodus from the cities has slowed down? And what's happening in the rental market? We haven't seen much in the way of new supply. So why has rental price growth slowed? Welcome to The Elephant in the Room. This is the podcast where we love to talk about the big things in property that never usually get talked about. I'm Veronica Morgan, real estate agent, buyer's agent and buyer's agent mentor, co-host of Foxtel's Location, Location, Location Australia, author of Auction Ready and co-host of Your First Home Buyer Guide. And I'm Chris Bates, mortgage broker, recently ranked number five in Australia out of over 18,000 brokers in the annual MPA Top 100 Mortgage Broker Award. Before we get started, I need to let you know that nothing we say here can be taken as personal advice. We always recommend you engage the services of an appropriate and experienced professional. Today, we're joined by CoreLogic's Head of Residential Research, Eliza Owen. We've had Eliza on the show a number of times, and it's always a treat. Not only is she the author of my favorite property report, the Pain and Gain Report, but she has a talent for uncovering the meaning in the data and being able to explain it so that it all makes sense to us. So great to see you again today, Eliza. Thank you so much for coming along. Thanks for having me. Great to be here as always. Eliza, always good to chat. I hope you're well. I guess um, you know, we're middle of 2023, coming into the spring season. Um, you know, 18 months almost since the first rate increase. Um, how, how what's your sort of take on it all? Like, you know, has the market been way more resilient than you expected? You know, is 2023 playing out like you expected? Like, what's to come? How, what's your sort of take on on where we're at? Yeah, so my take on where we're at is that we're in an upswing, but it's an uncertain upswing and there has been some momentum that's left it, I would say, since a recent peak in May. So nationally, home values bottomed out in February. Um, They've risen for five months consecutively, but the pace of growth, uh, yeah, peaked in May, 1.2%. It's now eased to 0.7% through July. I'd expect it to sort of come out at a, at a similar level for August. Um, and I think that it was the June rate rise that knocked a little bit of momentum out of the recovery. Um, that's where we started to see some steam coming out of the auction clearance rate as well. Uh, And on top of that, as you sort of alluded to, we've also seen a really interesting trend in the lead up to the spring selling season where new listings have actually been rising through winter, which is not normal at all. And that has probably added to some of the momentum lost. I think fundamentally there is a supply and demand mismatch in the housing market, but the current state of interest rates, which is still very high, and affordability constraints will probably keep a bit of a lid on the price growth that that's um, reflected in that supply and demand piece. So what do you think the spring market is looking like in terms of new listings? Because uh, Ecologic not only looks in history, but you guys have got that little window into the future in the pre-listings activity. So what's that telling us? So pre-listings activity has actually slowed down a little bit over the past four weeks, which is really interesting. It's actually sitting a little bit lower than than where it was this time last year. Um, So that could speak to the trajectory of new listings in the next few weeks, which might start to flatten out. But they'll be flattening out off slightly elevated levels by now because that new listings trend has risen about 14% nationally through winter to date. Um, compared to the historic five-year pattern, which is a decline of about 5%. So I think we'll be, again, we'll we'll probably see a little bit of uncertainty around the start of the spring selling season. Um, If we get another month of rates paused, continued property price increases, and even the clearance rate, which bounced back a little bit last week, that could entice more sellers to the market as well. Now, we're talking very much an aggregate data here. We're talking about the whole of the country. I mean, if you look, compare, say, Sydney uh, clearance rates to, say, Brisbane clearance rates, very different story, isn't it? But um, also, generally speaking, listings has been off a very low base, right? 
And so are, are you saying that the, or I guess, where, will that increase in listings bring us back to long-term averages or are you saying that's already surpassed long-term averages? In Sydney and Melbourne, the rate of new listings being added to the market is now surpassing five-year averages and it is nationally too. It's the first time since September last year that the new listings trend has been above average. Um the and with September last year being really where you know listings activity started to to dip lower, um, and you're right in the sense that that uplift in new listings has been much stronger in some markets than others. So Sydney up about 25 percent, Melbourne new listings 29 percent, and those are the markets where we've seen a lot of that price deceleration as well. Um, Sydney's growth rent. Uh, growth rate went from about 2.8% in May this year to just 0.9% in July. Perth hasn't seen much of a budge and generally the smaller capital cities have seen a smaller uplift in new stock. Um, And certainly the supply demand fundamentals, total listings levels in smaller capital cities remain quite low and that's keeping price momentum relatively high. Eliza, in there sort of the the coffee chats, the water cooler chats at CoreLogic, I mean, are you guys a little bit surprised with the resilience of the the property market, given just how much borrowing capacities have dropped, how much interest rates have gone up, and um, and why do you think that it has been so resilient? Why we were in a bit of an upswing, even though we're at you know affordability stretched and borrowing capacities the tightest it's ever been. Why do you think it's it's been so strong? Yeah, that's a great point. And it is something that's surprising. I would have expected property values to keep declining as long as interest rates were rising. But despite a May and June hike, property values were were well into an upswing by then. Um, and, And that continued, albeit with that loss of momentum. Um, I think historically, if we look back at the relationship between interest rates and property prices, there have been times where growth rates and interest rates have moved together, um, such as in the uh, early, it would have been um, post-2008 when you were getting really strong population growth. And of course, high levels of net overseas migration is another feature of the environment we find ourselves in now. So just that fundamental demand. Of course, as you know, people don't often borrow right to the top of their borrowing capacity. So even if borrowing capacity is reduced, it doesn't mean that uh, lending values reduce to the same extent. And there could, of course, be people borrowing with either very low levels of debt or, or no levels of debt, such as, you know, older Australians who are who are downsizing. Yeah, I think that cash buy is definitely a, a key part of the market, right? I think that, you know, they're not affected by interest rates, they're not affected by borrowing capacities. And, you know, they still got a lifestyle need, whether they want to um, downsize or whether they want to buy an investment or a holiday house or whatever it might be, that they can still play in this market. They see it as more or less like an opportunity. I mean, what are some of the other key things that are, are really supporting prices? Um, I mean, you mentioned listings are going up. I mean, my worry is that that's a investors selling, not owner occupiers. And um, you can see that I think investors are a bigger portion than historically. Um, and B, they're targeted investor hotspots um, that are getting much higher listings versus say, the home buyer market, but also a lot of invest uh, people are trying to get ahead of the spring uh, selling season, right? To get it on the market before more stocks comes on, right? Um, and agents are more incentivized to do that because they want to get runs on the board because they're not getting many sales. And total listings has almost been falling because the market's been, you know, absorbing them. Is are you worried that you know there was this a lot of talk around this abnormal winter listings, but as these months play on through the year, it's just it hasn't actually transcended in this whole heap of listings on the market, which early signs maybe got us to believe. Yeah. So I think there's, there's a few layers there. Um, and at, broadly, I would agree. I would say that, you know, the um, prospect of serviceability issues with mortgages, we sort of flagged early on as something that might create an unseasonal uplift in new listings. Now that that's actually happened and talking to real estate agents, you're right in that part of this is not just that people might be needing to sell. Part of it is that they might want to. Selling conditions are better. Average days on market has come down from 33 days uh, at the median level at the start of the year to, to 28 days across the capital cities. Uh, Prices have been going up. Um, The clearance rate is rising. And 
we didn't really have much of a spring selling season last year. So it could be a little bit of catch up and early start to the spring season, as you say. I do think when you look at some of the data quite granularly, there are maybe some more sus things that come out in the data. Like, um, uh, you know, you mentioned the investor selling. So CoreLogic tracks the portion of listings that come to market that we we infer they are investment properties. It's not guaranteed that all of them are because we're just guessing based on the rental history. <laughs> so where a property comes to market for sale and the last activity was, was a listing, that's um, a rental listing. That's what we're inferring. Now that portion has gone up from 25% um, decade average pre-COVID to about 36% across the combined capitals at the moment. Uh, new listings have been rising, so it's not as if the underlying number is is lower. It's that that investor listing um, number is is up as well. Um, and so that could be because there's investor churn from a lot of investment activity during the 2010s. It could be that um, mortgage serviceability is more of an issue for investors because even though um, uh, rents have gone up, they've not touched the sides of the kinds of increases we've seen from interest rate rises. Um, so that to me is a little bit of a you know thing thing to watch. Um, although investor activity is coming back too, in, investor purchases have risen since the start of the year. Um, so it could be that new investors are, are coming in as well. And the other kind of, I guess, more red flaggy piece for me was matching this listings data with uh, more heavily mortgaged areas, particularly the owner-occupier mortgage info you get from the ABS. So the um, outer west suburbs of Melbourne, like that kind of Melton, Bacchus Marsh area, that's where we'd seen um, a rise in new listings, a lot of mortgaged households and it's not as though price growth was really accelerating, you know, so that might be an area where you say maybe that is people having issues of serviceability and I don't know. It's all inference from from my end because I'm not on the ground. I'm not talking to people and asking why they're selling. Um, but I think there's a couple of minor red flags that you could pull out from the data if if you were really looking at it closely. Now, what can you see a big difference between the cities and the regions? I mean, we go back to 2021 and the entire country seemed to be, you know, going up and obviously regions outperform <laughs> the cities. What's happening now? Are we seeing a reversion back to normality? Are we seeing, um, yeah, so the, I, and I know that there's a slowdown. So do can you elaborate on that for us? Yeah, that's a great question. So th this upswing that we've observed so far is very much back to being led by the capital cities, which is what we would have seen historically. Through COVID, you're quite right in that there were population factors, changed housing preferences, and that induced an upswing in the regional market that was larger and lasted longer than what we saw in the capital cities. Um, looking at quarterly growth across the combined capitals through to July, July, so the past three months, um, combined capital city values rose three and a half percent. They were only up one point two percent across the the capital, um, the regional markets of Australia. So both are in upswing. Regions have seen less momentum. So as you mentioned, that comes back to a more normalised migration pattern between capital cities and regions of Australia. ABS data on this is pretty lagged to 2022, but CBA and the Regional Inst Australia Institute um, have collaborated on, a, on an index that looks at net migration to regional Australia. That's come into the June quarter of this year, and that index is essentially showing uh, those net population movements are back at pre-COVID levels. So a very long-winded say a, a way of saying that regional migration is normalised. <laughs> so, and, and on that, I mean, I know Hobart is a capital city, but it's, you know, it's smaller than some of our mainland regional cities. There's quite a different thing happening there, isn't there? So what is happening in Hobart at the moment? Yeah, so anyone who has listened to my appearances on this podcast in the past probably knows I'm obsessed with Hobart. I'm so bullish about Hobart. It is going through a correction, and I think it's going through one that was quite inevitable off the back of um, the 
the highest growth rate of the capital cities over over the past decade. Um, Values have virtually doubled um, uh, across the city. Um, In the in that sort of past decade of growth before this adjustment, there were only a handful of times that that values actually fell across Hobart. So I think that's part of it. Um, it's just a correction off the back of interest rate rises and affordability constraints. It's been a long time coming, and that's why it's probably quite a bit, um, or it has been, uh, a, a lot sharper of a decline than what we've seen across other capital cities. So just looking at the current annual growth performance across Hobart, it's still down 11.5% year on year. Um, by the time we get the August data, I think in some of the larger capital cities, you might actually see an increase in value year on year. Adelaide and Perth are up year on year. So yeah, it does sort of stand out as one of the weaker performance at the moment. Um, but it's in a cycle long term. I'm still pretty confident about that <laughs> month. <laughs> it's a lovely city to visit. Now I'll be taking it to my grave. Like <laughs> <laughs> the total listings in Hobart, though, that's swelling too, isn't it? So um, because that just shows that whatever new stock is coming on the market, obviously with those those price falls, that um, you know that the days on market must be ex- must be expanding and the stock levels are expanding. So you know because Hobart. For you know, go back beyond before that latest boom they had. You know, it was in the doldrums for a long time. Yeah, that's right. And I, I think you could still argue that total listings levels are still lower than what they would have been. Um, you know, pre pre that boom as well. Um, so it's it's been quite an extreme cycle. I've also heard talking to the Real Estate Institute of Tasmania, they were saying that there's a bit of a standoff in the rental market at the moment, which is also now starting to slow down. And Hobart house rents were up by a very small amount. I think it was 0.2% over the past year. So they're pretty much flattening out. And they've had an issue where um, I think there's just a stickiness around price expectations versus what tenants can really afford and also versus what, you know, tenants can access under certain affordability schemes and things like that where rent needs to be capped at 30% of their income. Yeah, I want to talk. We want to talk more about rents, but just wrap up the sort of sales side of things first, because um, in you've recently, you know, CoreLogic's uh, released some reports recently, and one of them showed a like really above average purchasing activity in Perth. What's driving that? Do you think? So Perth is actually, I mean. It's almost like the opposite of Hobart, I guess. It was sort of in the doldrums for a really long time with the mining boom and bust patterns that we saw through the 2010s. Because it is a relatively affordable market, I think it's been relatively um, unaffected, if you like, by rising interest rates. A lot of the anecdotal feedback we're getting is that um, purchases are quite common among East Coast investors. The relatively affordable price point, CoreLogic puts a gross rental yield uh, on the Perth dwelling market of um, 4.9%. So it, it's attractive from, from that sense. It's had tailwinds as well of positive internal migration, which hasn't been seen across Western Australia for a very long time. Um, and of course, with uh, international visits welcome and, um, you know, the the return of overseas migration, that's had an impact as well. So you would expect then if um, a lot of that above average purchasing activity has been driven by East Coast investors, then that might put some downward pressure on rents in Perth? Yeah. Uh, And if you look at monthly, I mean, sorry, I should qualify. I don't exactly know what portion of purchases are East Coast investors, it could still be majority owner, it would still be majority owner occupier, um, but that's one of the areas of, of strength for the market. Um, yeah, and, and rent growth is slowing in Perth, but <laughs> it's happening very gradually and it's happened off the back of like a 50% rise in rents through the pandemic. Perth has had the largest increase in rent values of the capital cities. Um, so, but Wasn't you know, the vacancy rate in Perth something like 20% at some, like in recent history? Or am I imagining that? As in the back series of vacancy rates would have 20% of 
Yeah, so, look, I mean, and this this is I'm I'm relying on memory here, which can be, can be you know remarkably unreliable. All of our memories, but particularly mine. So I'm talking well before COVID. I'm talking sort of within the last decade. But wasn't there a period of time when when the vacancy rate was absolutely astronomical? Or am I just imagining that? Well, it wouldn't surprise me. I haven't got the back series in front of me. I know that the peak to trough decline in home values across Perth was 20%. You know, talk about the property market never crashing. Like, I think it's safe to say that Perth has absolutely had boom and bust conditions. Um, but at the moment, the Perth vacancy rate is sitting at 0.7%. Right. There's, there's room, you know. <laughs> <laughs> there's room for it to go up. Yeah. There's room for it to go up there. Yeah. <laughs> on on In terms of... Uh, you know, as I said, we'll get into, I want to understand more about rents coming up, but when it comes to supply and listings, right? So supply is easy to measure, isn't it? You And you've got old listings, new listings, but at the end of the day, you've got whether you measure inventory, whether you measure as total listings or new listings, it's easy, right? But can demand be measured as a standalone or is it always in the context of supply? I think it is always in the context of supply. That's a really good point because even though new listings have increased across the market, it's been very well received by buyers. That's reflected in the clearance rate, which is um, averaging uh, or it it was sitting at 67% last week. It's been averaging above uh, the longer term decade average of of 63%. Um, Sales volumes have... They're not at the crazy levels they were in 2021, but they're kind of normalizing, especially in the capital cities. They've been trending a little bit higher as well. So I think that comes back to, you know, the fundamentals of supply and demand are there. And uh, it's just something that maybe price and urgency has a little bit of a lid on it with the affordability and and interest rate piece at the moment. Is there any sort of... um you know, relationship with CoreLogic and, you know, search activity and, you know, the big, big platforms out there, are they sort of giving you access to what's happening on their platforms to see how engaged buyers are, how many in the buyer pool? Because, you know, I guess the REAs or domains and things like that, or have you got your own way of measuring the amount of buyers out there through engagement with real estate agents? Is there any way that CoreLogic's measuring buyer activity? Yeah, so I guess it would be that CMA kind of pre-listings activity. But in terms of the buyer perspective, we're a little bit limited in that space in knowing about them. We know a lot about the property. (laughs) We know pretty much everything about the property and not as much about the buyer. But I mean, that's such an opportunity, isn't it, for like, you know, looking into into how we can expand in that space. Um, But yeah, not probably not as much as as much insight as you'd get from behind those portal inf- interfaces, yeah. Yeah, because consumer sentiment is the lowest it's been for decades, right, and yet prices are holding up, in fact, have been increasing. So do you have any insights or thoughts as to how those two things can be true at the same time? Yeah, I I mean, the sub-indices of um, time to buy a property has sort of been coming up. Uh, I, get, I get the sense that... You know, if you look at the latest um, consumer sentiment data, it was really weighed down by mortgage holders as well. So maybe it does come back to that piece around which buyers are more active at the moment, whether it's people who who are weighed down by higher interest rate settings or or scared of higher interest rate settings or, yeah, um, it it is quite an extraordinary one to reconcile, but it's the same in reconciling that relationship between interest rates and property price movements. I guess there must just be exceptional circumstances around population growth and things like that. And, you know, people per dwelling, which has been a big part of the um, demand piece as well. Well, actually, that sort of does lead us into the rental um, (laughs) part of the conversation quite nicely. Because um, rental price growth has been slowing, uh, even though vacancy rates are still extremely low. And I'm wondering whether those people per dwelling or, you know, that that change to the average household si- size has got something to do with that. Yeah, I think it must. Um, and that's quite pronounced across regional Australia in particular. If you look at annual growth in regional Australian rent values, that peaked at 
an annual growth rate of around 12% back in 2021. Annual growth in regional rents has now slowed to 4.5%. Uh, if you look at some of the sub-regions like the southeast of Tasmania, Southern Highlands and Shoalhaven, rent values are actually falling, albeit coming off very high levels. Um, so it's important to remember that even if nothing happens to supply, and presumably supply is rising because there's been a big jump in investor finance since the start of the year. Um, but even if nothing there changes, tenants can react and they can probably react in a more liquid way mm. than an owner occupier because they don't have the same transaction costs and their leases vast majority are less than oh, 12 months or less. So I think it's, it makes sense that you would see a tenant reaction in the rental market first and, and foremost. And again, if you look at regional Australia, the RBA was reporting on that average number of people per dwelling, which seems to be back at pre-COVID levels now. So more share houses, more people in share houses. Um, and that migration of young people from regions to cities is probably a factor as well. I'm on a personal mission to help more people make better property decisions. And you can find out all about what I'm working on at veronicamorgan.com.au. And there you'll find resources for first home buyers, details about my buyer's agent mentoring program, access to suburb help for investors, or if you're looking to buy your dream home or an investment property in Sydney's inner west, eastern suburbs or lower North Shore, you can connect with my team at Good Deeds Property Buyers. If you're thinking about buying your first home, upgrading to a new one or purchasing an investment property anywhere in Australia, we would love to carefully guide you through this journey and importantly, get the finance right. Please reach out via our website, wealthful.com.au. Don't forget that you can download our free full or forecaster report. Which experts can you trust to get it right? The elephant in the room.com.au. Eliza, we've got um, a lot of talk around the fixed rate cliff as well. I mean, I know you did some research or an article on it recently. I mean, what's your take on where we're through that? Has it been a bit of a storm in a teacup? You know, people believing that there's this magical moment when everyone's just going to be forced to sell? Or what are you seeing in terms of on your end and the data side? Yeah, great question. So I guess when it comes to the official data on the mortgage market, I defer to APRA, I defer to RBA. RBA in their latest statement on monetary policy for August was reporting that we have now passed the peak of the fixed rate cliff. And the way that they measured it was by looking at the portion of outstanding housing debt that was rolling over from low fixed rates to high variable rates, but they did it as a portion of the major bank lending only. So it doesn't quite give us the full picture, but from that, um, they estimated that it was about five and a half percent or a little under five and a half percent in the June quarter. And that was kind of the peak and, and now we're through. So, you know, the, it, it was, I guess, more of a kind of low wave rather than a cliff. <laughs> um, the vast majority of our mortgage market is variable. So we can always look to the variable part of the market to say how are households dealing with rising interest rates. And to be honest, we have some official data on it. We know that arrears are still extremely low, about 1.2% of the outstanding housing credit, uh, lower than pre-COVID levels. We know property prices are still rising. Listings volumes are rising, but as we discussed earlier, that's not necessarily tied to selling decisions due to serviceability. Um, so I guess the stuff you don't see is what people do in order to keep servicing their mortgage payments, whether that's, you know, picking up more hours at work, or, or I guess you could see that in, in, um, labor force data, um, or, you know, what else they're kind of sacrificing in order to see that their mortgage is still serviced. Uh, and the official data on arrears is also a little bit lagged. Uh, the latest data we have is for the March quarter. And even then that's looking for payments that are 30 days or more late. So, you know, there, there is a bit of a lag to it. But I think overall, as we as we work through it, we see there are some households that are impacted. There are some households that are making tough decisions, but it certainly hasn't been the implosion of the housing market or the mortgage market. I've got a bit of a theory and it's untested because I've got absolutely zero data to back it up. But 
<laughs> there's a human, you know, humans are, you know, we're fallible creatures and we don't always think as logically as we think we think we think we are. And when there's sort of the threat of something big looming, there is a certain proportion of us who will make knee-jerk reactions. And 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 I so my theory is that there's always a certain portion of the property owning uh, population that will, uh, whether they be homeowners or whether they be investors, who will knee jerk, who will sell preemptively thinking that it's going to, you know, that I want to catch a falling knife, that's all going to fall off a cliff, they're going to get out early, they're going to be the early exiters, you know. And so I've got this sort of theory that that potentially there was a blip in terms of sales activity you know, at some point in the last, say, 18 months, that may well have been dissipated, may well have been over and done with because that portion of our market has gone. Do you think that there might be any legs to my theory? I think I'm, try- <laughs> I'm, trying, I'm trying to, to understand, understand the it. theory. So are you saying there would have been a big sell-off at the start of well, I'm just yeah. wondering, particularly with investors, right? Because, you know, and I know our costs have gone yeah. up, mine have gone up, they've gone up. I, you know, I don't want to come across like I'm totally unsympathetic. I mean, it's hurting me too. Um, but, but you know, like if you look at the pain and gain report, which you know is my favorite report, and you look at so the March quarter data there, and in and I know that investors always typically lose more money than than owner occupiers anyway, and they they don't hold the properties as long, and there's all the, and they also they typically will buy units and they don't buy houses, and there's all these reasons why uh, investors are more likely to sell uh, at a loss than than an owner occupier. But you did talk about the uptick in investors selling. And I'm just wondering whether they there's a proportion of investors might have sold expecting costs to go up, um, it, and expecting market conditions to get worse. Exactly. Yeah. Rather than necessarily waiting until the death. You know, an owner occupier is going to hold on to their property, and do they'll eat baked beans, they'll work three jobs, they'll you know they'll they'll the kids won't go and do excursions. I mean, you know, they'll they'll make all those really awful tough decisions before they sell the house. Um, but a, an investor, however, is going to probably react to the pain or the threat of pain a little earlier. That's that's my theory. I'm just wondering whether perhaps, you know, it will be interesting to see your next pain and gain report to see whether that's continuing or not, I guess. Yeah, definitely. That, so we'll, yeah, the... I think that proactive selling is definitely a thing. Like I have had conversations with people who have said, oh, Eliza, I can't afford my mortgage in November. Should I sell now or then, you know? And I think people maybe, uh, yeah, that's a really good question. I don't know because I would have thought if if I were in that situation, I'd probably sell before the bank was coming to (laughs) repossess my home, right? Yeah. (laughs) But maybe some people do wait. Maybe some people, you know, just wait to see what happens and and others are more proactive about it. The banks have been pretty proactive about getting in touch with their customers and by the sounds of things, sort of real estate agents. So that could be a factor as well. I think possibly not so much about the the pain, you know, the, the, bank chasing us, but prices falling, the perception that prices are going to fall, it's going to get worse, my situation yes. is going to get worse. And so, and but I do love that you've given me a, a term for my theory, which is proactive selling. Proactive selling. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to use that now. So welcome to it. <laughs> Thank no you. Worries. And I think you're right, right? If, if the market sort of kept on going down, you know, late 2022, early into 2023, we started seeing listings going up and you know, there just wasn't enough demand for the listings, right, and prices, then absolutely there's a perception the prices are going to be cheaper next year, right? And so you see more proactive selling. I wonder if there's a bit of proactive selling from investors in recent times just because it's a good time to sell, right? Like I yeah. I might as well just take my money now. I've got a bird in the hand. I know I can walk away with a decent price. That's going to mean I'm going to have less stress on my home. So it's probably proactive, not because – they're worried about, you know, market falling, um, but just because they're under debt stress. Um, but I, I would say we've got some clients who are definitely, you know, money's tight, right? Um, absolutely. And and we're having conversations every week around this. But I feel like they're now starting to see there's a horizon. There's this a light, the end of the yeah, tunnel. <laughs> like potentially, yeah, okay, maybe it's not, I don't have to worry about prices falling. I'm really confident around that. Um, yeah, I've got to still service the mortgage, but actually, you know, inflation data is looking really strong and maybe that's going to lead to rate cuts in, you know, in the foreseeable future. And maybe, uh, rents have got up, so maybe my negative cash flow isn't as bad as I thought. So 
you know, that's what I'm probably seeing is people are like trying to get over this bridge, I guess, the COVID term of, you know, building the bridge. What's your take, Eliza, on the, you know, the global sort of inflation story and, you know, and how RBA is going to respond to that and and, and APRA too? Yeah, I think that's looking a lot better. I'm hopeful. (laughs) So inflation is sort of, I guess it's been led by the US um, through, through, Uh, the past few years, that's um, US inflation sort of bottomed out recently at 3% and then ticked a little higher to 3.5. But it's come down from, you know, similar um, levels to what it was in Australia as well. So uh, Australia's June CPI figures were looking really good, a 1% drop in both the headline and core measures. And of course, we're also looking at um, housing market data every day, which has a feed into inflation as well. So the continued slowdown in CoreLogic's rent values are a leading indicator of the CPI rents. Um, CoreLogic's measure of construction activity has been easing to pre-COVID levels of growth, which is another indicator that the new homes um, segment of the CPI will continue to come down. So I'm quietly confident that we're getting over that inflation hill and that that's going to guide monetary policy. Um, The sort of outlook for the major bank economists is that the cash rate could come down in 2024. There's a lot of variance in the timing of those forecasts for 2024. Um, But I think that uh, is another sign we're sort of getting over the hump as well. How do interest rates impact rents? Do they have an impact? Yeah, I I think they do. I think that it's it's a bit of a um, complicated relationship that maybe goes both ways because rents are an input into CPI. So if rents are rising, inflation rises, and in response, um, the interest rate needs to go up. So by that reasoning, you know, you can explain why maybe rents and interest rates move together. And right, go up at the it. same time. But then you've also got things like um, if you reduce interest rates, you can increase your housing investment activity, which then serves to bring rents or not bring rents down, but at least slow the, the annual growth rate in rents. Um, so there's a couple of ways that they're related and they kind of impact each other. And for 2024, I think it's going to be that latter scenario where a reduction in interest rates, even the whiff of a peak in the cash rate, I think has kind of instilled confidence in the market. Um, and we've seen about a 13% jump in investor housing finance for, for property purchases through the start of this year. So. Now, that's quite interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, the popular, you know, you know, uh, understanding is that in- higher interest rate environments are not good for investor activity. And also there's quite a lot of um, publicity around, particularly the Queensland and the Victorian state governments and, and their, their leg- proposed, in Queensland's case, attempts at legislating uh, fairly un- investor unfavourable um, legislation and in, in Victoria that's still on the table, right? So I wonder why, I mean, any theories as to why investors are seeking to, you know, re-enter the market or enter the market? Yeah, I would argue that investors in Australia are capital growth driven in most instances, not rent driven. Um you know, even investors who are holding their property over the past few years will have noticed a extraordinary outpacing in their mortgage payments relative to the rental income they're getting. Um, and the latest tax data was at a snapshot when rents were really high um, or when rents were rising really quickly. And it showed that 50% of Australian investors were uh, um, using a negative gearing strategy. Now that we've gotten higher interest rates and rent growth is easing, I think that number will show the majority of investors will will be using a negative gearing strategy by now. Um, so, and our biggest investment markets have the lowest gross rent yields, right? Sydney and Melbourne, three to three and a half percent. Uh, Sydney has had one of the highest capital growth positions of the capital cities. So that's why I think it is. And I think that investors might be speculating that if they can cop higher interest payments in the short term, then longer term when the cash rate eventually does move lower, um, 
then they'll benefit from buying in at a time where prices weren't reflecting that lower interest rate. Got it. Now, interestingly enough, you talk about, I mean, you guys have got access to, you know, great history of data, property data, right? Um, You've got aggregated data of the whole country. Then you look at, break it down into cities and regions and different and regional cities. And, you know, you can slice and dice that data in all very exciting ways. And I'm hitting you with a question that's just totally off off cuff here because we just came back off off another interview with a, a, a data, a property analyst who claims that all property basically, you know, if you've got a long enough period of time, all areas will grow at, at the same rate across the country. Now, my own observation is that that's not the case, but you've got access to greater data than I've got. Have you observed that that's the case? Or, you know, if you basically wait long enough, all areas will end up reverting to the same mean? Is that the way it works? Or is that not really possible? I'm just having a quick. <laughs> I'm just having a <laughs> I know quick I've quick thrown it. Is that you? Uh, um, that's a really good question. I can kind of see where an argument like that might come from, but I think the answer is probably not. Um, I think no matter where you invest, if you hold it for long enough, you'll get decent return. Um, but you know, there's all sorts of interventions and factors that can distort that idea of a reversion. Like think about the like mining boom and bust in in Perth is a really good example or what's happening in Melbourne at the moment where, uh, you know, there's a lot of tax changes to really, you know, kind of transform the dynamics of the housing market. So I wouldn't say it's a guarantee, but I can see (laughs) that, yeah, if you hold a property for long enough, maybe you're riding out all those different factors. Let me get back to you. Let me do some. Re- <laughs> I feel a blog coming on. <laughs> yeah, cool. I shall <laughs> watch with bated breath because, <laughs> you know, I mean, this is, you could argue, I mean, there's arguments that um doesn't matter where you buy. And, you know, to a degree, I'm a little bit like that. I'm like, you know, if you buy a really good asset in any particular location, you hold it for long enough, you're going to be do better than if you're trying to pick a hotspot because, you know, there's more risk inherent in that. Um but uh, you know, there's there's lots of different arguments around uh, property prices and what they do. I mean, one of the things that I find fascinating, for example, is that if you look at aggregated data for the country, and I think it's something like you know eight percent roughly per annum growth um, is 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 the national growth rate for the last hundred years or something, um, if you average it out, right? But if you look at the pain and gain report, and I have read it again recently, Eliza, you know, your most recent one, which is March 2023, then I think it was something like 20 odd percent of the people that sold and lost money had held the property between eight and 10 years. So it's a significant proportion of the loss making sales. Um, If I got the percentage right, something like about 1,200 people. (laughs) A lot of them were in Perth. (laughs) <laughs> a lot of them were in WANT. So, you know, I think those states had really been reeling from the extended um, fluctuation in, in that industry. I'm just, you know, having a quick look now. There is a range of, um, you know, 20% total um, capital growth sitting at around 85, oh, sorry, 87% in Darwin. Um, over a 20-year period, my fave Hobart up 154%. So even over that relatively long period, yeah, there's quite a there's quite a variance. I don't know how far back you need to go and how much you need to adjust the windows to then get the same growth rate. Yeah, because of course the problem is that the real that our market isn't a pure market driven market, is it? There are interventions, as you said. So therefore, you can't really just you know if you're going to assess it and take out you know adjust for those interventions, then that's sort of not the way the market really behaves anyway. Yeah, and I guess like mining markets are a bit of an exception too, right? So maybe that's that is quite different to areas that might have more economic diversity. Um, and Hobart would be a story of just coming off a low base in that particular time period too. Mm. When are you planning to move to Hobart, Eliza? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I need to be. I need to be in Sydney and um, yeah. 
work from home. I know yeah. you didn't buy that long ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. Mm-hmm. Eliza, what's going on for the next six months? Like what's in your brain? So, I mean, listings is absolutely something that um, I'm excited to sort of track, right? I want to see it, not just at a city level. It's more at a suburb level. And, you know, on your sort of report, you you really highlight that there is absolutely house and land packages, you know, Western, you know, Melbourne could be an issue. Hobart, definitely you got some massive rises in listings. If that doesn't get absorbed, then buyers are going to be sitting on their hands. Sellers are, you know, you're going to start seeing a decrease in prices and most investors want to get out because they think the good times are over. So listings are really interesting to track. What are some of the other things that, you know, given where we are in the cycle, you really want to start tracking and you, you're wanting to do sort of blogs on and, you know, some really interesting takeaways we can sort of focus on in the next six months to to track because I do think it's a, you know, every downturn you learn, you know, lessons, right? You know, you would naturally assume, right? Like I, I'd hope Chris Joy will come on and um, admit maybe that, you know, that he was his his natural, you know, thought that interest rates are going to go up 4%, price is going to fall 40%, prices have got to fall 15 to 20%. Um, you know, so what what's your take on the next six months? What are some of the big things we, we should be watching? So looking at the data historically, I'm a big believer that supply is informed by price rather than the other way around. There is a leading indicator between um, prices and new listings added to the market. So as we move through this period where demand is tested by the recent increase in new listings. We could see the spring selling season flatten out a bit if the growth isn't there. That'll be one to watch. Um, The completion of projects, we have this unusually high level of um, dwellings that are under construction but not yet complete. So again, slightly lag data to March, but the number of detached houses approved but not yet complete have gone from this decade average of around 70,000 per quarter to 114,000. Um, wow. And there's, but, can yeah. That, can that be put down to, you know, builders going broke? Yeah. Builders going broke, freight issues, um, increased material costs, tight labour market, home builder on top of that, like it's just gone absolutely Getting nuts. Getting finance. Getting finance, yeah. So there's a lot approved under construction, not yet complete. So what happens when it's complete? You know, that probably uh, relieves some of the price pressure and adds to supply and might take a bit out, out of the rental market because, you know, presumably people who's constructed you know, off the plan home is up in the air, they might be renting, waiting for it's that true. completion. Um, and I guess just the future of monetary policy and what that's going to do to prices, what's, what impact is that going to have on investment activity in Australia's housing market? Because we have just come through a nearly a decade or more than a decade of where interest rates were being moved structurally lower in the fallout from the GFC, what what's it going to be like post-COVID where, you know, um, RBA or um, Phil Lowe sort of flagged um, in, in a speech that he gave that we could be subject to inflation spikes down the line with global conflict, extreme weather events, and even the transition to renewable energy sources um, adding to price pressures. So I think it's it's going to be a super interesting time, but I think those are the things that are kind of on my mind at the moment. Have you um, had a chance to read the intergenerational report that um... – you know, and some of the, I guess the, you know, the haves, haves nots, right? And 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 how that's going to potentially shift into housing over the next few decades. Have you had much thoughts on that? It's not a massive surprise to read that, you know, we're going to see more lifelong renters. That's something that's kind of already happening as property prices have outstripped income growth uh, and home ownership rates have fallen gradually over time. So I think it's important to have interventions to address that, whether it's making being in the rental market a bit better, more secure. I think the National Cabinet discussion around having minimum standards for a rental property, <laughs> we, though 
probably so obvious to most investors is is really important to have working appliances and running water and you know um so that's really pleasing to see and it probably just highlights maybe some of the interventions we need around boosting home ownership as well um and there have been plenty of good ideas that that have sort of been thrown around about that um and you know there's a lot more politically that it, it will we'll see what happens in October with the housing affordability fund as well I'm really um, interested to look from the investor side of things as well, because as as the federal government and the trickle down effect of that, um, building more uh, social or public housing, shall we say, so starting to invest in public housing, which has been declining for the last seven decades, so that increase, but also the build to rent sector, when because they're obviously different market segments that they'll be targeting, and then the role of the individual investor is going to change, you know, compared to how it has been in the last however many decades in this country. So I'm sort of interested to see how that that flows or that sort of takes shape, uh, and and I think that that possibly will put more pressure on you know that standard of investment property, you know, the idea of working appliances and stuff that's going to be make it's going to introduce competition um to the rental market that hasn't been there you know what i mean the, the, the competition just comes from what else is in the suburb as opposed to institutional providers of um of uh, accommodation so i think that that will change things myself i don't know if you're given that any that's thought that's so interesting not to the standard of rental property my understanding is that institutional investors are targeting a higher income cohort and therefore the the um, amenity is is usually nicer and whatnot. Whether corporate landlords are the ideal or whether they are better in terms of responsiveness to issues and things like that, I, um, I there is some literature around that that um, you know is is probably worth digging up as well. And if you have any thoughts with um, Chris Minns, um, is very vocal right now. It's about uh, we've got to build up. Um, we've got to create solution to rental crisis, housing affordability, more supply. Um, there's a lot of uh, heat or, you know, noise brewing in the Yimin movement, right, um, and the pressure to change the way our suburbs are. Do, do you think that, you know, now is the time where we're going to start to see, you know, state governments overruling local governments and, you know, basically, you know, densification is going to start to really happy and, and the happen and the NIMBYs are finally going to lose the battle? Yeah, I think so. I just hope it's done... Well, I hope it's done with a sense of equality and, you know, because it's often lower socioeconomic areas that bear the burden of higher density. Um, so I hope that <laughs> we can push over the YIMBY movement in, uh, sorry, the NIMBY movement in some of those more um, wealthy and well-located areas. I, th- I think it's a great initiative if if done right. Yeah. Yeah. Eliza, you got a property number for us? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> have you got another property number? I'm pretty sure we've asked about 15 of them, but have you got another one for us? I think I want to say with great respect to our policy makers over the years, I'm looking back in retrospect with my 2020 hindsight, I think a property Dumbo was probably home builder and just the additional um, demand that that put on uh, what proved to be a very constrained construction sector um, and brought forward a lot of property purchases that, you know, probably would have happened anyway in a more smooth, organised um, way yeah <laughs> so that's that's what i'm gonna say and they didn't just do it once did they they did it was it uh, from memory i'm pretty sure there was like a 2.0 wasn't there like a smaller grant or something yeah extended yeah. it and extended it and the reason they had to extend it was because commencements were coming on later and you know it yeah yeah, yeah. <sighs> just another too yeah. many sticks on the fire run. um and i think it stitched up the that's building industry it. when it was already had lots of challenges with labor and materials and um, well they didn't they yeah. didn't materialize uh, pardon the pun you know <laughs> that's the problem that nobody could see that coming and then this just, yeah. just basically set it up for a terrible fall yeah, yeah totally. I, agree. I think everything felt it was the right thing at the time even i acknowledged like it was great to see that kind of acknowledgement and support for the construction sector <laughs> but looking back i'm like oh <laughs> ouch yeah. yeah yeah thanks so much for coming on eliza always amazing to chat we'll look forward to chatting to you sometime later this year yeah take care guys thanks for having me all the best Thank you always appreciate it 
If you have a question that you'd like us to answer in an upcoming Q&A episode, you can send us a voicemail or written question via the website, theelephantintheroom.com.au, or you can email us directly at questions at theelephantintheroom.com.au. If you like what you're hearing, please share this episode with others you feel would benefit. And while you're at it, why not leave us an iTunes review? Five stars would be great. I know that sounds a bit cringy, but we have it on good authority that every review helps make it easier for other people to find out about us and hear what our 